Hi, this is Dr. Claire, and this is our lecture on body temperature and how that affects individuals' metabolism rates. Um, so, of course, environmental temperature is a really important thing that animals have to deal with, um, and the, uh, the temperature can have a really big effect on an animal. Um, so, uh, some animals deal with environmental temperature by conforming their body temperature to the environmental temperature. So, their bodies are basically the same temperature as their environment, and so they have adaptations that allow them to function at, um, at, tem at temperatures that are the same as their environment, like this fish here pictured on the top panel. Um, that fish's body temperature is probably almost identical to the water that surrounds it, which is very icy in this case. So that fish, fish has a very cool body temperature. Um, other animals will regulate their body temperature and maintain it at a level that is different from the environment. So an example here is the, the bird in the bottom picture whose body temperature is probably much warmer than its environment in that particular scenario. So um, these, uh, these uh, ways of dealing with temperature have a big impact on the physiology of the animal. Um, so body temperature is influenced by the environment, but it is also influenced by what's going on inside the body. So particularly the metabolism in the body. Whenever you uh, go through uh, cellular respiration, so you take sugars and you break them down to form chemical energy in your body, um, that chemical process produces heat as a byproduct. So the more um, metabolism you're going through, the more byproduct heat you're gonna produce. Um, so these marathon runners here, they, they are obviously uh, getting heat from their environment because they're running in a very hot environment, but they are also uh, working very hard and that muscular contraction that's happening in their legs and their arms is going to be producing a lot of waste heat as a byproduct. So their heat is coming not only from the surrounding atmosphere but also, or environment, but also from within their bodies. Um, now how heat can be transferred between the environment and the body, uh, there's a number of different ways that you can have heat transferred. Um, one is radiation. So for example, you know that if you stand in the sun, you feel warm, especially here in Colorado, and that's the solar radiation. So there's infrared radiation coming from the sun, and then when it strikes you, you feel warm. That's, that's a, so basically that infrared radiation is exciting the molecules in your skin and causing you to feel warm. You can also have convection. Convection is when you have a heat transfer to a moving medium around your body. So that can either be air or water. And um, so as the air or water is in direct contact with your body, heat can be transferred one way or the other. But when um, convection is actually when that, that um, medium comes in contact and then moves away, it'll carry that heat with it if it's cooler than your body. Or you can uh, deliver heat, but then more heat gets delivered when new air comes across your body or new water comes across your body. So a really great example of this is wind chill. So um, you may know that uh, when it's windy on a cold day, it feels way colder. And that's because normally around your body without wind, you create a little pocket of warm air that insulates you. Um, well, on a windy day, that, that warm air that's next to your skin will get blown away, and so you have convection, so you lose heat to the, to the wind as it blows past. You can also have conduction. Conduction is heat transfer through direct contact, so if you, you know, put your hand on something cool or something hot, and you actually touch another physical object, and the heat is transferred back and forth between them, that's how cooking in pans work, is through conduction. And then finally, you have evaporation. When water molecules uh, on your body go from being in a liquid state to being in a gas state that actually takes a lot of energy um, and so basically what's happening when molecules go from being liquid to being gas is that um, all the molecules are kind of they move they're shaken around and um, in in a body of water the one the molecules that actually become gas and leave are the fastest moving molecules so the ones that remain behind are actually the slower moving molecules so they're cooler that's heat is basically the the rate of speed of the different molecules in your in your body so um, when water evaporates the remaining tissue that it evaporated from is going to be cooler and so heat can be lost through evaporation as well okay so those are some ways you can transfer heat with your environment Another really important component of heat transfer is how much surface area you have relative to the volume of your body. So, um, of course, whenever you have a larger surface area, you have more surface that is in contact with the environment. So if the environment is very cold, uh, if you have a greater surface in contact with the environment, you can lose more heat to that environment. 
Um, but you also have to take into account your own size. So uh, how much surface area do you have relative to the amount of volume that you have? So a very large object has a big surface area, but it also has a very big volume. And so the surface area to volume ratio is actually lower than it is for a smaller object, which you can hopefully prove for yourself here looking at these different cubes. So um, an animal that has a very large surface area to volume ratio is going to have a hard time maintaining heat in a cold environment, whereas an animal with a very low surface area to volume ratio, which is generally a larger animal, is going to be able to retain heat better. So if you look at animals that, say, live across a temperature gradient, things like deer, um, you often find that um, in colder climates, individuals are larger, and part of that may be for heat conservation. Okay. Um, all right, so how do, how do animals deal with environmental temperature? There's basically three major strategies. You can be an ectotherm. Ecto means outside, therm is for temperature. So your, your temperature is determined by the outside temperature. So you're dependent on external sources of heat to warm your body. You can't heat up your body yourself. Um, then you have endotherms on the other side of the scale. Um, so those are animals that can regulate their own body temperature. They can produce heat metabolically in their body and maintain their body at a higher temperature. So endo is within, therm is temperature, so inside heat, basically. And then you have heterotherms, which can either behave as ectotherms or endotherms. So some examples of an ectotherm, reptiles and fish are generally ectotherms. They can't control their body temperature. Birds and mammals are, en are endotherms. They can regulate and maintain a high body temperature. And um, uh, things like insects are often heterotherms. Okay, um, so let's take a look at what that looks like. So here we have um, the body temperature of an ectotherm and an endotherm uh, varying by environmental temperature. So the ectotherm's body temperature it, it, here in blue is exactly the same as the environmental temperature. When the environment temperature, environmental temperature goes up, the, the ectotherm's temperature goes up. When the environmental temperature goes down, the ectotherm's temperature goes down. Um, in contrast, the endotherm, the mouse, maintains a relatively steady temperature, and it only really varies at the very extreme parts of the temperature range. Okay? Um, so if you're trying to maintain uh, um, uh, an internal temperature. If you're an endotherm and you need to maintain an internal temperature, what do you need to do? Well, you can be in environments that are too cold, you can be in environments that are too hot. So when you are in an environment that is too cold, um, oftentimes the best thing to do would be to uh, reduce the amount of conductive heat transfer you have. So reduce the amount of your body that is in contact with that environment. So reducing your surface area. So you tend to see that animals that live in very cold climates have short appendages, and, um, and they tend to be roughly spherical, like this seal here. He has very little surface area relative to his volume, okay? So he's not losing too much heat out of his skin. This camel has the opposite problem. He's too hot, so he needs to dump heat to the environment somehow, and um, having long skinny legs or big ears will help you to dump heat. So if you look at like an elephant, those really big ears on an elephant help them to dump heat to their environment. Um, the camel will also do things like urinate on its own legs, and then the evaporation of that urine will uh, help to cool the camel. Um, but again, also uh, maximizing that surface area uh, relative to the volume of the camel. <clears throat> Another thing an animal can do to avoid losing too much heat is to use countercurrent exchange in its extremities. So something like a gull or a uh, marine mammal that has limbs that stick out into the cold environment, if you look at them, something like a gull that's standing on ice, its feet are going to get very, very cold. If you then go and pump blood through that, those feet and allow it to return to the body, you're going to have really cold blood coming into the body, and that's going to be metabolically very expensive and very um, uh, stressful on the, on the metabolism. Um, but if you have countercurrent exchange, we saw countercurrent exchange in the gills of fish, uh, where the blood that's returning to the body is running this way and the blood that's going out to the feet is running this way, if they're right next to each other, then heat can be transferred from one to the other. And so as the blood is, trans is moved, traveling down the leg to the foot, it's right next to the blood coming up from the foot. And so uh, heat will be transferred from the blood that's moving down to the blood that's coming up. So the time the blood gets back up to the body, it's almost as warm as the rest of the body and you don't have to waste a lot of energy heating it up. Okay. Um, 
So some animals uh, don't regulate their body temperatures all the time. So uh, things like moths, for example, if you've ever poked a moth in the middle of the day, it didn't maybe didn't fly away right away, but it's, you start to see it shiver its wings. And what it's doing when it's shivering its wings, it's contracting the muscles in its thorax. And when those muscles contract, they have to burn sugar. And when they burn sugar, what's the byproduct? It's heat. So as they're shivering, they're warming up those muscles. And as the muscles get warm, they start to function better. And so that allows the, the moth to, uh, using its metabolism, using its muscles, to heat up its body so that it can then uh, function at a high level and fly away. Okay? But if you're a true ectotherm and you can't regulate your body temperature, then what do you do? Uh, so here's an example from marine iguanas. Marine iguanas are ectotherms. They can't regulate their body temperature even a little bit like the moths can. So when they're cold, they're very slow and lethargic and they can't do anything fast. When they're hot, they're pretty happy, okay? And so they live in the Galapagos where the air temperature is often quite hot but the water temperature is quite cold. But if you're a marine iguana, you eat algae off the bottom of the ocean. So what happens is that they will get into the water, swim down to the bottom, and start eating algae. And as they're in the water, their body temperature gets lower and lower and lower, and they get they start to move slower and slower and slower. And so eventually, they will reach a point where they're starting to not function terribly well. They'll climb back up on shore, they'll lay in the sun on a nice dark rock and get all toasty warm again, and then they'll jump back in the water to eat some more algae. And they just go back and forth and they regulate their body temperature by choosing what environment to hang out in. Okay? All right, so we've been talking about the difference between ectotherms and endotherms, and one other thing that's really important as a difference between ectotherms and endotherms is their metabolic rate, or how much energy they need to use uh, per unit of time, okay? Um, and if you look at something like an endotherm, they're constantly maintaining that high body temperature. That takes a lot of energy. Um, an ectotherm, they don't have to do that all the time, and so their energy levels aren't as high. So if you look at this graph here, um, the red line is our endotherms. The blue line is our ectotherms. And in this particular picture, they overlap, but if you look at the axes labels, so the, the uh, endotherm here goes from 10 to 40 metabolic units, and the ectotherm, its axis is over here, it goes from like half to four. So at every temperature, the endotherm's metabolic rate, or its energy usage, is higher than an ectotherm. So endotherms need a lot more energy. That means they need to eat a lot more than an ectotherm. So if you have a pet dog, you have to feed it every day, right? If you have a pet snake, maybe you only have to feed it once a week. It doesn't need as much food because its met metabolic rate is much slower than a dog, okay? Um, and then the other thing is that uh, an, an endotherm's metabolic rate is actually lowest when it's in an environment that is similar to its body temperature. If the environment is cooler than its body temperature or much warmer than its body temperature, then it has to start um, expending more energy in order to maintain its body temperature, okay? So if it's too cold, it has to shiver or run around or you know do something to keep itself warm. If it's too hot, it has to sweat or pant or do something else that's gonna cool it down. Um, both of those take more energy. So it's got the thermoneutral zone is actually at a kind of a medium temperature. Ectotherms, on the other hand, are completely dependent on the temperature of their environment. So as the temperature gets warmer, their metabolic rate gets higher, and as the temperature gets cooler, their metabolic rate gets cooler. We're gonna be doing an experiment in lab where we compare the metabolic rates of hamsters and geckos, which are two examples of a, an endotherm and an ectotherm. All right, if you are an endotherm and you are regulating your body temperature, what happens if you, the environment gets too extreme? Um, well, you're gonna die because um, endo, endotherms require their bodies to be at a particular rate in order for them to stay alive. And if their body temperature drops too low or gets too high, they're gonna die. Um, but you may notice that there's a much bigger range on the low end than there is on the high end. And why, why would that be? Well, um, when you are burning energy, that creates the byproduct of heat. So when you're too cold, you can burn a bunch of energy to warm up. You can shiver and jump around and do all this stuff, and that'll produce heat that'll warm you up. 
The, the only problem is if you can't burn energy fast enough to stay warm or you run out of your energy resources and you can't stay warm. If you're on the hot end, as you go further away from your thermoneutral zone, you have to burn energy to try and cool yourself down, but the byproduct of that of energy burning is more heat. So um, if you go too far, if you get too hot, um, as you're trying to cool yourself down, you're also making more heat and you can get out of homeostasis much more easily and you can die. Um, so there's a less of a range on the upper side of the thermoneutral zone than the lower side. Um, if you're in endotherm, another thing you can do is, if you need to save energy is to allow your body temperature to get cold. So hypothermia is when you have a below normal body temperature and some animals will go into hypothermia voluntarily as a means of survival. So it's regulated hypothermia. So one example is hummingbirds. Um, at night, hummingbirds go into a state called torpor where they allow their body temperature to drop by about 20 degrees or so. Um, and when their body temperature is lower, they have to burn less energy in order to maintain that body temperature. But they can't be active at that time. So they're very lethargic. Um, if you find a hummingbird at night, you can poke it and it'll just sit there. It won't fly away. Um, it can't fly away. It has to warm back up before it can fly away. Um, but it burns a heck of a lot more energy when it's warm than when it's cold. So hummingbirds have such fast metabolisms that um, they could actually starve to death overnight if they didn't lower their metabolic rate. So they need to lower their metabolic rate overnight so that they can survive that period of time when they're not going to be able to feed. Um, other animals, like squirrels, will hibernate over the winter. Um, and in hibernation, you allow your body temperature to drop very close to the environmental temperature, so very close to zero. Um, and when, you're, when your body temperature drops that low, your metabolism goes way down. You don't need nearly as much energy to stay alive when your body temperature is very cold. Um, but the problem is that when you need to heat yourself back up again, heating yourself back up again takes a huge amount of energy. So the me metabolic rate on this graph is here in blue. You can see when the animal is trying to heat itself back up again, it has to use a huge amount of energy to get its body temperature back up to the normal range. And so most squirrels and chipmunks will actually go through bouts of hibernation. Um, over the course of the winter where they'll wake up for a few hours and usually like go to the bathroom and then they'll go back into hibernation again for days or weeks at a time. Um, a lot of people think that bears hibernate. Bears don't actually hibernate. They go into a state of torpor kind of like the hummingbird where they allow their temperature to drop a few degrees and they become less active and they are they do burn less energy in that state but they don't allow their bodies to go all the way down to close to freezing like the squirrels do and the reason for that is if you're a bear and you weigh 500 pounds the amount of energy that it takes to heat up 500 pounds of bear from zero degrees back to normal bear temperature is way more energy than they have stored in their bodies. They can't store enough fat in order to heat themselves up. Whereas a squirrel is much smaller, it doesn't take as much energy to heat a squirrel up. All right, one more uh, comment about endotherms, which is the, uh, the, the metabolic rate and body mass. So um, if you look at the amount of energy that's used per gram of critter, so per wheat of critter, um, bigger animals use less energy per unit weight than smaller animals do. And that comes back to this idea of surface area to volume ratio. So if you are a very large animal and you need to maintain a body temperature, a constant body temperature, if you have a lot of surface area relative to your volume, if you're a very tiny animal like a shrew or a mouse, then um, you're constantly losing heat to your environment. You need to burn a lot of energy to maintain your heat. If you're a big animal like an elephant, you have a huge amount of thermal mass. You've got this big body that is not going to change temperature very quickly. And um, you, you're not going to lose as much heat to your environment. So you actually, you actually need less food per unit mass than a small animal does. So a shrew can starve to death in a matter of hours. They eat mostly insects and um, mostly insects and earthworms and things like that, although there's some really creepy shrews that eat uh, mice. So a shrew is about this big, a mouse is about that big. It's pretty amazing that a shrew can eat a mouse. And shrews are like, whew, they're super creepy. They've got, they, they, okay, so you pick up a mouse by the scruff of the neck, the mouse goes, 
and just sits there. You pick up a shrew by the scruff of the neck, it like turns around in its skin and tries to bite you. Ugh, they're creepy. I'm not a big fan of shrews. But they're really cool because they have this, they have this, such a high metabolism, they need to eat all the time, and they can actually starve to death within a few hours. An elephant is going to, could probably, I mean, it probably wouldn't be happy, but it could probably live a few days without getting a meal, and it would still be alive, okay? So uh, different metabolic rates for the different sizes of animals. Okay, that's the end of our lecture on temperature and metabolism. Catch you next time.